NCAT or the National Center for Appropriate Technology? Well, we help people by building resilient communities through local and sustainable solutions that reduce poverty, strengthen self-resilience, and protect natural resources, which is what we're doing here today. We're teaching you how to be more resilient as farmers, as people who want to be involved in sustainable agriculture and earn a good living for your family and your community. We, we are a, a trusted practical connector. We've been around since 1976. And what we do is connect farmers to valuable resources. So our website is full of publications for beginning farmers, advanced farmers, expert farmers. Come to us if you have questions about how to do some of these things that you're trying to self-teach yourself on, right? I didn't know about NCAD, and I wish I had because I had to do a lot of self-learning in my farming journey. And I'm really happy that I, I work for them now because we help people every single day. So I encourage you to check out our podcasts or YouTube videos and our publications. Okay, let's get cruising. So before I worked at NCAT, I worked for MIVO, the Mawa Environmental Volunteers Organization. We are a 501c3 not-for-profit organization based in northern New Jersey. I started this organization when I was 16 years old. I'm 31 now, so it's been 14 years of awesome environmental work. And Mevo does a lot of different things. We're not talking about Mevo today so much, but just to give you a little teaser, um, we do things like trash cleanups. We work with students removing illegal dumping from the forests of Stag Hill in Mawa, New Jersey. Uh, the forests of Stag Hill are home to the Ramapo Lenape Indian Nation, uh, and their home at land unfortunately has been dumped on for the last 40 years. We've worked with them since 2011, cleaning up garbage, organized over 130 trash cleanups, removed over 600 tons of waste. So we're talking a lot of work. But besides cleaning up garbage, we also farm. So we have a fresh roots farm, which is a market garden. Uh, and we have a second farm in town as well. I'm going to talk about in a moment. This field is where we host our farm to table dinners at. Uh, it's a two acre uh, market garden style farm doing intensive grow practices. We have about four farm staff that run this space. And we also provide educational programs on it. Our second farm is Lovewell Farm, which is about 10 minutes down the road. It's a one-acre field behind a McMansion. Um, in New Jersey, we have a lot of McMansions, <laughs> and we managed to get a homeowner who had a little bit of extra land behind his house to give us that acre to convert. So in New Jersey, our big issue is not being able to find farmland. Um, so it's actually very dense and urban, which is great for farm-to-table dinners because we have customers. Um, but you have to find a spot to actually host these events and grow food. So just a little bit on our growing practices, we're doing 30 inch raised beds, 18 inch wide pathways. We focus mostly on leafy greens, tomatoes, high value items. Um, this is our tomato production. We don't do it inside a high tunnel. We do it in, in field. We're doing a lower and lean system, similar to what you might see in an industrial high tunnel setup. Um, we base a lot of our style around the lean farmer and also, which is Ben Hartman and JM Fortier, the master gardener style. This is us planting garlic in uh, in the fall. And we work a lot, as you can already see, with our community. So we have thousands of volunteers that come out and work with us at the farm every year. And I could show you infinite cute photos of kids using shovels and tools and all that great stuff. Um, but we're going to skip through that. Um, we harvest, <laughs> we harvest our, our salad mix by hand with open yell knives. And we also harvest some of our greens with a quick cut greens harvester as well. So we are on that type of scale and we've been having great success with this process and model. So it's about quality over quantity for us. We ha it has to be, unfortunately, we don't have the space and we've been having a lot of great uh, financial success with this. We sell our food through a CSA program. So this is our CSA stand we set up on Tuesdays. Um, that's our farm, one of our old farm managers and staff members. That's uh, one of our CSA boxes there. And we also sell at the Ramsey Farmer's Market. This is our farmer's market stand on a typical Sunday. Uh, close up of some of our crops. Another shot of our peppers and our tomatoes. All right, so now we're gonna get into why you're all here, which is farm to table dinners. And we're gonna start with a video. So let's see if I can actually get it to work. Yeah, here we go.
Okay, so that's a video of Mevo's farm to table dinner that we do every year. It's called the Mevo Farm Feast. And it has been a great success for us uh, organizing it each year. We have done seven dinners so far. We're going to be doing our eighth this year. And I encourage you all to do this system if it fits within your model of farming and style of, of what you want to be doing with your farm. It has a lot of rewards to it, but it is very challenging. So we're going to go over the various ways that it works for us, also as a not-for-profit, and how you can transition that to your for-profit model as well. So. Why should you plan a farm to table dinner? Um, well, it builds brand loyalty and connects people to your farm. This is a huge thing for us, right? People who are our customers, they meet us at the farmer's market. They enjoy buying our food. They've never seen the farm before. They come to the farm for this magical evening, this dinner. They, they have this life-changing experience at this dinner, and they just bring in their friends and their family to tell you their neighbors about it, and it becomes the highlight of their year for a lot of people. Some people plan their anniversary dinners around our farm to table dinner. You know, people plan their, literally will plan their vacation calendar around when our dinner is happening. So you just get repeat customers for all parts of your farm operation. Um, it, it gains new revenue. So if you're selling vegetables or any type of farm products, you're now getting revenue from the exact same products you're already selling and growing. So you're getting additional funding without having to reinvent the wheel in a sense. Um, it formalizes your farm operation. So if you tend to be a, a farmer that's a little messy, leaves things out of the ground, maybe a tool over there, or a tarp over there. Well, when you have 135 guests coming to your farm, all of a sudden you're cleaning everything up and, and hey, the farm looks better because of it. And we have found that our farm has become tidier and tidier and more disciplined because we have this farm dinner that holds us accountable to how it looks. Um, it's so much fun for your farm team and for yourself. It is a, a massive stress until it happens. But then the day comes and you're actually having a great time. Um, it's just really good marketing. You get professional photographers there. They take photos of people enjoying your farm and, and eating everything. And it's just every photo you have is so great for helping you uh, outreach about your farm. So what are the negatives? There are some. Uh, it's a lot of planning and a lot of work. Um, so it takes us about, we start planning the day after our dinner ends. So it's a year in advance and you're going to have a lot of extra time put into getting this market stream off the ground. The best part is though, when it, once it is off the ground, every year it gets easier. And now on a going into our eighth year, it's very much plug and play for us. We don't have to like reinvent everything every year. We kind of know what we're going to do and it's just become more and more efficient. Um, okay. Uh, you know, it demands that you effectively market yourself. So if you're not a good marketer or don't want to go out there and really sell tickets to your dinner or really talk your farm up, you're going to struggle with this, right? Because you're going to have to be outgoing when you're at the farmer's market. Like, hey, 
thanks for buying the tomato. We have a dinner next week. If you'd like to come with your wife, it's a great experience. So you're going to have to really sell yourself on social media, on Facebook, you know, everything, website, newspaper ads, magazine ads, and also, of course, in person. Um, and there's also an upfront investment in resources and equipment to get this going. Okay. Uh, I recommend a farm to table dinner for farmers who have at least had three years of successful farming. So not someone who's really struggling, uh, I'd say, <laughs> don't, this is not your out from, from struggling in farming. You want to have a couple good years where you're at least making some money, feeling like you have the, the water, at least not over your head too much before you dive into this, because this can make or break a farm. But if you are feeling like confident, you feel like you know what you're doing, you have a good handle on things, then, then go for this because you will be thrilled that you did. Okay, so infrastructure. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you need to be a farmer who's been doing this for a little bit so you have the infrastructure for this. Electricity, right? Clean, potable drinking water. Um, you're going to need stainless steel equipment in some capacity, particularly at least a stainless steel sink with cold and hot water accessible to it. Um, there's lots of solutions to get yourself hot water to your to your sink because in our wash station, we only have cold water throughout the farm season. But for the dinner, we set up a hot water system just for the dinner. Um, you know, you're going to need your refrigerator. Uh, you're going to need someone with a serve safe certification. So in New Jersey, I don't know how it is here in Illinois, but we definitely need that. And when a health inspector comes, if there's not someone there with that certification, they'll shut the event down. So you have to have someone that ha you can get. It's not hard to get, but someone needs it. Um, Generally, to prepare for the dinner, you need a commercial kitchen off-site that can, yet you can use to prep for the dinner because you're not going to cook everything on-site at the farm. It becomes a health liability. So you prep most things off-site, and then the day of the dinner, you bring everything on-site, you cook it right there, and you and you feed people. Um, and of course, you know, depending on the size of your farm, you're going to need an open area. So you know, for us, that was actually the trickiest part because we don't have a lot of land. But having an open space, and also you're going to need the parking for about 50 to maybe 150 people that want to come and visit, which can be up to 100 cars. So where are they going to park? Okay, so the main thing you're probably wondering about is like money. How, do you, how much money are you making, man? Well, here's all of our money and revenue for all the past years. Um, 2022 and 2021 are definitely the most relevant because we knew what we were doing then. But I will say you can look back and you see that 2020 was a very rough year for us. That farm feast, I would say, was a failure. Uh, we, we just tried to adapt to COVID and it just didn't work. It just didn't work. Um, but we tried. Uh, 2019, 2018, 2017, 2016 was all just a learning process, how to sell tickets, how to efficiently run this event. Um, I'm going to run through these just a little bit so you can get some perspective. So obviously we have our gross income for 2022. We have our net profit, which is roughly 30,000. We had $20,000 in expenses. And that's important to remember. Uh, this year was a little higher than most because we did a silent auction that was very stocked for this event. And doing a silent auction, particularly with charities is, is common, but we did like some crazy like trips to Africa that cost us a bunch of money. It was a little too far, but but yeah, you know what? Like, hey, we were like, let's try this out. Um, I will say, though, I, you guys may be thinking that you don't want to do a silent auction. And I will say this, uh, as if you're not a not-for-profit, you are a for-profit, you might not be able to do something like that, which is fine. Um, you don't necessarily need to do a silent auction. In fact, you can see in 2020, we only made about $6,000 from that silent auction. So compared to uh, 2022. Um, you know, we do things like a raffle in addition to the actual dinner and we, and the big moneymaker that we have yet to really get going for us is the, uh, the value added products. So we know that people will buy value added products in droves at the dinner, right? First of all, they're a little drunk, right? They, they've come, they're eating, they're drinking, they're having a good time. You come by with some like calendula lip balm. They're like, give me that, man. They're, they're dropping dollars for it. And I mean, <laughs> first of all, it's a great organic product for the farm, right? But at the same time, uh, people are a little, you know, looser with their money towards the end of the dinner. So all I'm saying is, if you feel like these other things, sponsorships, silent auction, raffle tickets, that can't work for you because you're a for-profit, hit the value-added products, man. Sell honey. You know, we, we've sold honey for many years. It was great. All types of homemade products from the farm, and you will be happy that you did. Um, 
And then obviously the ticket sales. So our tickets are $165 a ticket this past year, this year, this 2022. But before that, every year before it was 135. And I believe the first year was 115. So you can start doing these dinners for less. You can even start at 80, you know, start, you can start small. And as it becomes more and more successful and the demand increases, increase the price. And you know what? Every time we've increased the price, no one said anything. They were just thrilled. They're like, oh yeah, no, dude, you should have been charging us double. Like no problem. Um, that's why it's a feast, right? It's a feast and people enjoy it. And they, they actually feel they're getting such a deal. They, they want to pay more. And I, and I swear that's, that's what they tell us. Um, okay, so infrastructure. This video is, is a video of Jess, our farm manager, Tilling, tilting the bed. But I want to point out this area in the back here. That area is where we host our dinner every year. <laughs> and you can see it's actually our uh, bulk material storage. So we have our wood chips and our compost there for most of the year. And it's a massive production for, for us to actually remove that material. But uh, we remove that material, all of this bulk stuff. And then by the time the dinner comes, we have a nice flat space that we uh, place the tent for the dinner. Um, you can see we, uh, our dinner is always under a tent. We've had seven dinners and five of them they've rained during. So we're always debating, oh, maybe we'll have to spend the money on the tent. But if it gets rained out, it's worse. So I will also say, depending on the time of year you're doing it, it's just nice to have shade. People you know, don't feel as hot or cooking in the sun. Mosquitoes tend to stay out a little more. It's just, it's just better to have some type of overhead coverage. We also used to do this. So we used to, in the, in October, used to have these side skirts on the tent. Uh, we found that that was a waste of money, mainly because when it does rain, it doesn't rain in sideways and it gets everyone really hot. So when you have 130 people in a tent, everyone just, it gets so hot in there that we wind up taking the sides off anyways. And the tent company charges us more for these sides. So don't do them. Um, okay. Last thing is the time of year you're going to do this dinner. We used to do our dinners in October, like October 15th, October 10th, uh, which we thought was a good time because it was be better for us. Like towards the end of the season, we had we knew we'd have a bunch of great crops in the field. But we found that the challenge was that was that it was a it was cold, a little bit colder at night, which didn't always matter. But some nights, some dinners, it was a little too cold and people complained. And the other challenge with that was that the farm was kind of turning over for the winter and it was looking a little ugly. <laughs> no one said anything, but we're like, man, our tomato plants are kind of dead and they're just kind of sitting out there in the field next to the tent. So we moved it to August 10th and it's been the best decision ever. Well, August 10th has seems to be the day um, right around then. So just to give you some context, uh, Sterling Rentals, and I know this is all New Jersey stuff, but hopefully gives you some perspective. Uh, Sterling Rentals in Patterson, New Jersey is who we rent from. $4,000 for tablecloths, napkins, silverware, all the plates, coffee maker, coffee mugs, and for seven tents. So that is a very good price. And I think you should strive to have that type of price if you're going to rent stuff for this. You're essentially planning a wedding, but instead of it being a wedding, it's, it's a farm to table dinner. Okay, and this is the the layout that we have here. Um, you can see we have like tablecloth tablecloths down the middle. We have a, a nice burlap runner. Um, we have napkins and forks. Everything everything is set before the guests arrive. Um, we have a lot of wildflowers that are all picked from around the farm and from our pollinator meadow that fill our fill our uh, one gallon jugs. We own all the mason jars. So the mason jars, we just own and we wash them every year and use them as the drinking glasses and for our water dispensing. But we do rent the other stuff. We used to do a single table right down the middle of the tent. And that proved to be actually a, a, a challenge because once you get up from your seat, it's a ton of distance to walk to get around the table if you're going to go to the bathroom or something. So we actually changed to this model, which is two rows of tables with, with just a little space in between, like a foot and a half in between, so people can slip out if they want. Um, we also can fit more people in the tent now, so you don't need as longer of a tent, you save money. Um, and that middle walkway tends to be very popular. Okay, so what are, what are the tables we're using? We're using picnic tables that we borrow from a local park. So we reached out to the park. They have like a lot of like picnic tables for people to enjoy themselves on the weekends. And we just, you know, kind of pleaded with them. We're like, hey, could we borrow the, the tables for one day and we'll put them back? And they're like, yeah, we don't care, of course. 
So we roll up with our, our trailer the day before the dinner. We load up all these picnic tables, bring them to the farm with a couple staff. We lay them out, and then this is what everyone's sitting on, but you wouldn't know it because obviously those tablecloths hide the fact that they're just park picnic tables. You can also rent tables, but we felt that these were more of an earthy, rustic look. We have a band, and we put them on top of our uh, tractor trailer. Uh, so, you know, this is our, our 20-foot hot pink trailer. Uh, we position it there at the end of the tent, and then the band plays right on top of that. There you go. There's our, one of our bands. We've had a couple different bands over the year years. It's like $400 to $600 to rent a band. I would say that's how much we've paid. Um, uh, we did get a couple like college kids the first year to play, but the problem was they kept going and smoking weed during the show. And I'm like, dude, dude, I know I've only paid you guys a hundred bucks, but come on now. You, you know, they're like, Hey bro, we'll be right back. But, um, so that was, that was a lesson pay for professionalism. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So th this is how we're setting up. And remember you, Nevo is a youth organization. So we do have a lot of college kids kind of around, um, uh, so, so this is what we do before the dinner happens for about two weeks. We set up, um, the tent comes in about four days before the dinner starts. And then we wire it up with string lighting. Um, you could see, uh, this is Jacob up here. He's got a roll, a roll of string lights and he's just twisting it around the top of the tent. Um, and then these lights in the corner are just hardware lights from home Depot. So they're probably like $12, $15 a light. Um, and we reuse all this every year. So we buy a bunch of Christmas lights, we buy a bunch of hardware lights, and now we have great mood lighting and we use it every dinner. So we don't keep it recurring that cost. This is what it looks like at night when everyone's enjoying the feast, um, the farm's all lit up. Here's another shot for you to see. And the other thing we're doing throughout the course of uh, the, the, the week is we're getting flowers from around the neighborhood to make centerpieces in all the tents. Um, these were taken from a local uh, corporate office. Uh, they tend to have lots of uh, just beautiful flowers that are littering the landscape. We snip a couple. They don't seem to notice and, and helps us help helps us out getting free, you know, some free beautiful flowers. Um, <laughs> what else are we doing leading up to the dinner is we're harvesting for the dinner. So we take off CSA that week and we take off farmer's market that week. By the way, I recommend that. Like if you are a farmer who goes to the farmer's market every single week, take off three weeks sporadically. You know, find some weeks you're going to take off and take them off. You will be thrilled with the vacation. Um, we, we've enjoyed it immensely. Uh, same with the CSA. And you know what? We took the CSA off twice. We think we take it off one week out of the year or maybe twice, including this. And our CSA members don't mind at all. They're like, yeah, you know what? My fridge is full of salad. Like, cool. Enjoy your, enjoy your week off. Um, the other thing we're doing is we deconstruct our wash station. So in the back here, that's our wash station here. And we have this, this stainless steel sink in there that we use for washing, but we take that out. We bring it to our temporary kitchen location and hook it up for the kitchen. Um, and again, here's just another shot of the table with flowers. Okay, before the dinner commences, about a day or two before, we have our chef, one of our chefs here, so this Chef Mike. He's cooking on a grill, pre-preparing the food on site. Um, there's another chef here that came out, uh, and I'll talk about her later. She's cooking some steaks on the grill, um, and we do some pickling before the event as well. So we have a custom-made grill. We had a guy who was a friend of ours. He fabricated this, but we also went ahead and um, bought all the metal for him. So we we came up with the design. You can actually you can see the design. It's very simple: a square with a grate on top, right, um, with a coal box in the bottom. And then we asked our friend to weld it. So he welded it. We bought all the metal, and it was a good uh, partnership. The other way we cook the food is right here. It's a camp chef stove, three burners. Uh, we have two of these, and those are what we use to uh, basically keep the food hot and prepare it the day of the dinner. So between this grill and these two stoves, uh, maybe we'll have one or two other little things, but that's basically the whole dinner is prepared with that. This is the commercial kitchen that we use uh, in preparation for the dinner. So uh, there's a local ski resort uh, like down the road that's shut down during the winter. And what do they have? They have a, a commercial kitchen that they're doing nothing with because no one's skiing in the summer. Um, so we borrow their kitchen for the week and they're totally cool with it. And we go in there and, and we just prep everything, you know, so for roasting stuff, we're prepping it all in there. So we're food safe and we store it in there in their refrigerators. 
so that the health department doesn't have a heart attack that we were doing this all out in the middle of the woods um, or in the middle of the farm. We've had two different chefs um, for all the years until 2022. We had this gentleman, Mike. He was a volunteer chef and he, he is a professional chef, but he wanted to help us out. He likes to farm. And let me tell you, he's not the only one. We've had like four different chefs offer to cook a dinner for us. And, uh, you know, he was the guy that we wound up taking. So for six years, he, he did this dinner with us. Um, and then last year, he was like, dude, I'm, I'm ready to take a break. He just wants to have dinner, not cook it every year. Uh, <laughs> he was thrilled to not have to cook it this year. But we found this amazing chef who I can't, I can't recommend enough. Isabella Gariepe, uh, that's her website. She's the nomad chef. She travels to farms and organizes farm to table dinners. She cooks dinners. So we put her up in a hotel. She's from Canada. She drove down to Jersey and she stayed with us for a week and we paid for her hotel, hotel, hotel fare and obviously paid her. Uh, and she cooked the whole dinner. That's her over here. And that's one of her, these are two of her friends and colleagues here. So she does this as for a living. She just goes to farms and cooks farm to table dinners. And she said she's used to cooking on like an open fire and like, 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 you know, a little, little camping stove, you know? So she was blown away with what we had for her, but she said she could do what she could have done with a lot less. So she's very capable. And I, I encourage you to check her out. Um, just to give you an example, this is a menu from this past year. You know, we had an appetizer board, um, you know, we have an entree, you have your kind of like palate cleanser in the middle, and then you have your main course, um, you know, everything we do. A, a, we've done all sorts of dishes every year and the chef and the farm manager really collaborate to discuss how this should be done. And we let the chef kind of guide it, but we also have our, you know, we have opinions too, and we'll, we'll go back and forth with her. Um, and the menu is different every year. And uh, it, it's the menu's never been an issue for us. It's just like, as long as we have fresh vegetables, we can figure out a way to make them beautiful. We do source cheeses, meats, um, and some fruits from neighboring farms and from distributors because we don't produce cheese. We also don't produce pastured raised beef. Um, so we'll, we'll get that from neighboring farms. Uh, so here's a couple different menus from over the years. So let's talk about how the day actually works. The guests arrive at 4.30. We have a farm tour at five o'clock, which I highly encourage you do because the farm tour gives people, you know, kind of illuminates what you actually do on the farm and is such a good marketing opportunity for you. So they come, we give them a big tour, then dinner ends at nine o'clock. The whole event's like four and a half hours. It's, it's actually very efficient. Um, now there's a lot of obviously all that amount of time leading up to it and then clean up afterwards, but the guests are only there for four and a half hours. Uh, this is a more detailed schedule of the evening from this past year, but you can see server arrives. The health inspector usually arrives right when the dinner starts. <laughs> you know, so you're just pulling your hair out. You're like, oh my God, I hope we, I hope we pass. Uh, you got to have bleach nearby. Don't, don't not have bleach. I'll promise you that that's it's important. Uh, it turns out, you know, we're all hippie. We're like, oh, we don't use bleach, only vinegar. And she's like, what? It's like, oh, never mind. We have bleach. I promise. So I, I will find some. Um, <laughs> So uh, we have a photographer that comes every year and takes photos, obviously, sometimes two or three. Um, we have a group of volunteers and staff that work the dinner. I think this is still working. Yes. Okay, good. And then um, farm tour. And then this is the, the layout of the evening. So on the left here, this is Violet. She's the executive director of Mevo. And that is uh, Jess, our farm manager. And this is them on the right running the farm tour. Um and so every, you know, there's a lot of these guests here just enjoying it. And, and, you know, the farm tour can go on for 30, 40 minutes. We, sometimes people want us to go for like an hour and a half, but we just want to get dinner going. While the farm tour is happening, uh, we have our volunteers here that are helping run the dinner. And these volunteers, while the farm tour is happening, they're dealing with the appetizers. So for a couple of years, we did an open buffet of appetizers. This is how we did it. Um, we just have, you know, a little table out there people can take as they want. Um, here's another example of dessert in the same fashion. Okay. Um, but we actually changed this model. So instead of this kind of like bulk model, we changed it to uh, putting a charcuterie board on the table with, you know, a farm salsa and farm pesto and farm garlic sauce and pickled beets um, and cheese. That seemed to be more popular. And also it just seemed to work better for, for what we were trying to do. 
Um, and I, I recommend this. So the charcuterie board, the actual wood, we just made that, you know, on the farm. And then that's all laid out and people can eat from the table that they're sitting at instead of going to the bulk spot. Um, this is this year's charcuterie board. And the volunteers that we have work the dinner, there's about 12 to 15 of them. And uh, every young person, every college student, uh, now this doesn't have to, this could be for you, it could be a family member, it could be someone who really likes you guys, someone who's a regular customer, you can, you can figure out who these people are. But everybody wants to help a farm dinner come together. There's something in our DNA. To, everyone wants to party, you know? So it's like <laughs> everyone wants to be part of something like this. So well, the way we do it now is we have one server for one table. So if we have 15, 16 tables, we'll have 16 volunteers. But sometimes some servers will get two tables. And that works far better than the way we used to serve. And I'll explain that. But um, you can see Max here. He's got his his tray of, of of plates that are all going to the people sitting at his specific table. This way, no one ever misses getting some dish because there's one person who's responsible for getting you that dish. Uh, here's some more volunteers bringing down trays of you know salad and soup. Um, again, this this system seems to be great for us. So this is the plating system and. Uh, what we used to do is this, right? So this was this was family style. We go around with trays and kind of ask people, "Would you like more? Would you like more?" It was very inefficient. Um, tended to you tended to drop a lot of stuff, um, and it just people got missed. Some people would never get people like, "Oh, I never got steak." It's like, well, you just paid a lot of money to be here. I, I, you really need to have steak. Like, so it's 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 embarrassing for you as the organizer. If someone gets missed. So when you do this system with the trays, uh, where one person gets one table no one's ever missed and and also you get this personal relationship between the, the the server and the table everyone's having fun uh it's just way more uh, better for accountability okay and then also obviously this right so we didn't have trays back in the day we didn't realize they existed so we're bringing down two plates at a time all right <laughs> and we're, we're thinking man we're good we're like we're serving we're serving it's like no we're doing like a hundred trips per order right so um get a you'll get trays um, this is a dessert uh, going out on a tray. Again, this was way, way better of a move. Here we have the chefs. So the best part about this is the chefs plate everything, and they double check everything so that the whole dish is complete. It looks good. It has everything on it that, that's proper. No one's going to miss the apples or the or the little flower ornaments. And then your server, the volunteer, he'll they'll just they just got to take those plates, put them on a tray, and go down. It doesn't have to be rocket. So they don't have to do anything with the food except carry it to the person. It's very efficient use of people. Um, here you have another example. So here's a volunteer that's helping them finish these desserts while they're plating them. And this is the line. So we have the kitchen set up nearby, you know, outside in the farm field, and then we have a, the lineup of people coming and kind of getting the food and bringing it down to the tent. And this is a shot of that. So here's the kitchen tent, right? And here's our walkway. And then we're in, we're standing in the farm feast tent. The benefit of this model is that the people who are eating the dinner can see the chef working, but they're not in the kitchen. The kitchen tends to be a pretty chaotic place. Uh, you know, there's a lot of yelling and then moving and there might be music playing. So one year we had the kitchen in the farm feast tent and it was awkward. It's awkward because the chef, there's some things the chef is doing that people don't want to see. They don't need to see you gravying up the chicken. It's just like, it just is extra. So by having it nearby, they can see that it's all local and cooked right there on the farm, but they're not in the kitchen with the chef. I also want to say, if one of these customers or one of these farm feasters rather is interested, they'll walk up there and they do. We have plenty of people throughout the night as they're drink, drinking their wine, they'll walk up and, and they'll see the kitchen, say hi to everybody but they don't have to be forced into the kitchen uh, when they're trying to have a peaceful evening with their family or, or loved one. Um, so here's just some shots of the dinner when things are moving and grooving. Again, we do BYOB. It's really nice for us because on the parkland that our farm is located on, uh, technically they don't allow any drinking in the park. So by doing BYOB, they're okay with it. They're like, look, you're not, you're not serving it. As long as you aren't serving it, it's all good. So people come, they bring their wine and we have a bottle opener for them and it's, it's flows perfectly. Um, just a couple more shots of the dinner and what that kind of looks like. You can see the band out there. <laughs> so my college band guys there in the back. Um, and uh, you can see yeah, more people enjoying and eating. This kind of a nighttime shot. And again, we have these stands here, these tray stands. So the best part about this too, when they come down with the tray, 
Uh, they're going to place it on these tray stands so that they don't act, have to hold the tray while they're serving people, and they serve off of this tray stand. So just thinking about your, your process for how you organize this dinner, the more people you have, the more efficient you're going to need to be um, to get it going. And then that's just another shot for you of the, of the dinner as the evening comes to a close. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Are there questions on, on any of this or happy to answer? Uh, yeah, so we sell tickets through our website. We sell tickets through our Facebook and Instagram, and we certainly sell it at the farmer's market. Uh, most of the people, when we tell them that we have a farm to table dinner at the farmer's market are like blown away. They're like, oh, that's amazing. I can't believe that's, you know, so we always have a big sign up and we always bring it up when people come by to shop and we sell it directly to our CSA members. In fact, you may be surprised, like you think CSA members already bought a share, but they will pay more money to also come to the farm and, and have a ticket for the dinner. So they, they, they double pay, they're paying for the share. And then they're also just coming to, they want to come to the dinner too. So uh, we thought that maybe the CSA members wouldn't want to do it because they're already paying for a share, but it's like, turns out the complete opposite. They're our biggest supporters. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so we used to have a bad mistake, which is that the farm manager and the executive director were working their butts off the whole dinner and just like sweating profusely and like, just can't say hi to anybody. And what we found out was that the real way this needs to work is everything has to be done in advance so that when the day comes, they can just dress nice and do their thing and meet people and give people their, the pleasure of their you know, attendance at the dinner. So that was a big, that was a big change for us um, that we had to learn through not doing that. You know? um, oh, by the way, I'm trying to think if there's any other way we were marketing. Uh, it, it really is the usual channels. What I found is set the date early and start marketing nine months ahead of time. And I promise you, if you start marketing nine months ahead of time, you will get the, the head, the head count you want because people have time to plan. If you tell them only a month in advance, they're like, dude, I'm going on vacation. I have another thing I'm doing. And when it's, when they're paying 165 a ticket, uh, they don't want to just spend that money instantly. They want to make sure their wife's okay with it. And they they really want to do this dinner thing. So the more time in advance, the, the better it's going to be. Yeah. I I think that's a great idea. I um we've experimented with doing a smaller more private dinners with like 12 people and just really nice fine dining with like a fine dining chef and charge a lot more and those people would be the type of people that may want to spend that money. The alternative for more uh, just normal you know people would be like doing a barbecue, doing like a really good uh country barbecue on the farm. Um, so you can play around with this and we certainly in future years would do more dinners. Like our hope is to do two to four a year, but right now, you know, one is enough because we also do all this other not-for-profit work, all the educational programs. So it's like, but as a for-profit farm, I'm certain, uh, I would be hammering these. If we had a system that worked like this, I would just be hammering these constantly. Yeah. Other questions? Cool. Oh. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. Off the farm. Cool. I mean, it it's all possible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I feel that I so I've never attended one that's off a farm, but I will say that there's a magic to being on the farm. I know it sounds cheesy, but it's like it, the, 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 the people that come, they, it's become such an experience for them that they, they want to keep coming back. And I'm not sure if it was like an off farm dinner somewhere that you would, it'd be, it'd be like, Oh, this, that was a nice restaurant. We may not go back cause it was expensive, but it was nice. You know, we want them to be like, that was an amazing, that was just an experience. And I want to keep going back. So I think the farm has a lot of power to it. Uh, and it has benefits too, for you as a farmer, you know? Um, yeah. Did you have something? Sure. No problem. Yeah, so I started the organization 14 years ago, and I've been, been with it now for seven years. I, I retired from running. I was executive director here until 2020, 
Uh, so I'm just a board member now. But when I was, uh, I, I basically ran the dinners until I was, you know, until 2020. And then at that point, the new executive director took over and she's running it better than I did. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So we have. Right now we're doing 35 to 40 families. Um, we do a pickup once a week. We do it from June to November, about second week in November. We take off about two weeks out of the year. Um, and again, CSA members seem to be totally cool with that. Uh, and we don't charge them any less. It's the same price. Yeah, it's, it's just the same price, you know. Uh, uh, the C, I think we charge, what are we charging right now? Like It's like 800 for a full share, maybe. Uh, I think it's about 22 weeks, 20 weeks or so. It's pickup only. No, we, so we, um, that's always a good question. So we have a set box that we're going to give them that week for a full share or half share. Half shares we've started to step away from, but we do still do those. And it's a set box. Like what, what they're getting, we are deciding. Um, and I and I'll tell you this: we do sell add-ons. So if people want to get like more Tulsi, we grow Tulsi, like Indian basil. Some people love it; they can buy extra. Uh, sometimes we'll have extra carrots. Sometimes we'll have extra tomatoes. And if we have so much extra, we'll just have a, a free extra section. So if it's like extra but not a lot of it, we might charge. But if it's like we have a flood of tomatoes and you want to do sauce making, then we just have like tons of tomatoes out, and you can just take them for free. So the, there's this beautiful balance of like overabundance some days and then you can pay for extra we also source eggs and we source mushrooms from other farms and provide that through the csa as an add-on and we've also done that with pastured beef in the past as well providing like t-bone steaks and stuff like that no no problem yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, that was a great question. Uh, so here's how it works for us. At, at We could not have the farm-to-table dinner the way we've been doing it at our other farm as much. So the other farm is behind a house. We have a lot of parking at that site too, but there's a family that lives there. And they're actually, to be honest, they attend the dinner every year also, but um, we just don't have enough parking at that location. So the Fresh Roots Farm, because it's in a park, has an immense amount of parking along the roadway. So we have a road that goes up to our farm and people park about uh, maybe a hundred cars deep on the side of that road. Uh, but it's not like a public road because it's a park property. So the people that are kind of slower walkers, they'll be dropped off at the front and then people will go back and find their parking spot. We do light up that section. So we run uh, LED lights that we bought from Home Depot shop lights along the road. Because at night, everyone's a little, little, little drunk, and they're kind of like trying to get back to the car. And when they leave the farm feast, it's pitch black. So we light up the road for a pretty long distance with these LED shop lights so that people can kind of get their, get their bearing on where they're going. Yeah, but that, that's how we figured out parking. Yep, yeah, sure, you could do that. We, we almost tried to do a shuttle system one year, but we realized that if we did a shuttle system um, so that people didn't have to walk the distance, uh, it seemed like it would actually take more time because people can just walk efficiently up to the farm. And also, we didn't want to have to get the police involved with, like, running a shuttle and, like, when who's driving and who's insured. Uh, I want to mention bathrooms as well. So so we have Porter Johns brought in for the day, okay? And we also have – they can provide you uh, sinks with the Porter Johns that are pump-operated with a foot. So you pump them with your foot, and then they put out – they have, like, everything you need, soap, water, and uh, paper towels – and that, and no one's ever complained. I know it's like high end, it's a high end dinner, and then there's Porter Johns, but they're really clean and nice ones, and they're only there for that one day. So, not many people use them. A few people do, and it's like it's it works for us. Two, we'll, we'll do two. Um, if we're really feeling like we need more, we'll do a third that's handicap. Oh, we'll always do one that's handicap accessible, and then maybe just two normal ones. Yeah, and then two or three sink unit. Usually two sink units. Yeah, so this year, I think we had our highest amount. It was 130 people. And uh, you might have noticed on the chart, we give out some free tickets. So people that really support us a lot, like as a charity, like they're like volunteering all the time or they're doing something awesome for us. 
like the chef, Mike, when he would volunteer to do the dinner, his family would come for free. So we'd give like four tickets to his family, his mom, his dad. So we would always use the, that's the other thing about the farm feast is like, it can become this gift too, for people that really support the farm and you have no way to really thank them. So it's like, this is a great way to say thank you. Um, also politically, uh, it's really good if you want, if you have like a local county commissioner that's doing something for you for the farm, uh, you know, this is a good way to thank them is just like, Hey, you want to come? We'd love to have you at the dinner. Thank you for per permitting our orchard. You know, <laughs> thanks for giving the permitting for this. Uh, they don't, and you'd be surprised a lot of times they don't come, but they'll say thank you and like really appreciate the gift. So, um, so I find that there's a good exchange with the giving the tickets out for free for some people. <laughs> right. Is it a political year or not? Um, are there any other questions on any of this? Cool. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you very much. Um, just a reminder to everyone in the room, um, we have association meetings tonight at four o'clock. Um, and so I believe that the Hort Association meeting is in room E, the Herb Association meeting is in room C, and the Vegetable Association meeting is in room F. So don't forget those if you're part of those associations. And then the banquet starts at six, I believe. So thank you and have a good afternoon. <laughs>